Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this program, um, New Jersey Monuments Out of Sight, Out of Mind uh, with Eric Burrow. I know that we had to reschedule it, so we really appreciate you all uh, coming back for this because I know this program is going to be wonderful. Uh, just a little Zoom etiquette. Please remain uh, muted. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat or wait till the end if you'd like. Um, if, the, if the question is relevant um, to a monument, I'll interrupt Mr. Burrow and ask that question. Uh, Mr. Burrow, welcome to the Parsippany Library. We're very excited. Please go away. Wonderful. Well, I want to welcome you all to, uh, to the talk tonight because uh, I understand you've got a talk coming up um, very soon. Uh, that's going to be talking about New Jersey and uh, the, the Declaration of Independence. And almost all the content I'll be talking about tonight is about, you know, we'll be celebrating in two years the 250th anniversary of New Jersey. Yet what about the 250 years that came before independence? Well, uh, that's kind of out of sight and out of mind. And when we talk about monuments, well, just remember that monuments aren't necessarily buildings. Uh, they could be trees. They could be some distinctive feature on the landscape. It could be a statue. It could be almost anything that is a reminder of times past. And we're going to be talking about times past. And I'm going to take you, this is the only thing from the 20, the last century, uh, because I'm using this photograph to take you to the highest point in New Jersey. But at the same time, I want to underscore that this is a monument, a war monument, a gift to the people of New Jersey that was a gift of about almost 17 square miles of parkland, which is now part of the New Jersey park system. It was a gift from Colonel Anthony uh, Couser and his wife back in 1930. If you're really feeling athletic, if you show up at High Point, uh, you can climb 281 steps and really feel like you accomplished something. <laughs> it was closed on the day that I was there, so I didn't have to take on the challenge. But this is the view you would have seen. And this is our starting point. This is the highest point in New Jersey, even without the obelisk at the top. Imagine for a moment that those houses and the bridge are no longer there. This is the old New Jersey, the New Jersey that existed before it ever got the name. What was it then? It was a landscape covered with trees. This area here, you're looking down at the winding Delaware River. New Jersey is basically, from a geographic standpoint, almost a peninsula. We've got water on the west, which is now called the Delaware River. You'll learn that it was called other things before. On the east side, of course, we have the ocean. And the states of New York and the states of Pennsylvania often looked upon this land as a hinterland, unidentifiable, unimportant to them, for they were focused on their urban landscape that evolved in early history of our state. But what happened here in New Jersey is just as relevant and oftentimes linked to their history. So let's talk about the first history of New Jersey. It's really what we have to say because Native Americans did not have a written language, but they certainly had a history, but we view them as the prehistorical period. 
And that goes back about 12,000 years. And yet there was a time when we became, or our forefathers, our forefathers in the state, um, knew these people in an ongoing way as they explored uh, the woodlands of New Jersey. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit now. Who were some of the personalities that were known that are actually historical figures in our earliest colonial history among Native Americans? Well, there was Chief Oratom, who was one of the Indians in, that greeted the Dutch back as early as 1618. And he was one that uh, kept not only peacekeeping negotiations and trade negotiations with early local Dutch settlers. The Dutch weren't just settling in New York, they were settling on the west side of the Hudson River as well. And a person we, we only know from writings, what a shame we have no monument for her, but imagine how courageous and talented a Dutch woman by the name of Sarah Kierstead must have been because she mastered the local Lenape dialect and she was the individual who was early on among the settlers that was able to transform the language from the chieftain to the language of the Dutch and reverse. In South Jersey, we remember although not identified. Uh, we certainly have a symbolic statue, not one with a multi-feathered um, multi headdress like shown out in the West, but actually a Native American shown in the woodlands attire that, that existed among the Algonquin and the Lenni Lenape. Uh, this statue stands in front of Mays Landing uh, Cape May, a rather Atlantic County Courthouse and was only dedicated back in 1981. But it's an outstanding, very heroic figure, uh, very true to form and uh, excellent symbolic of the people who covered the region that was not yet New Jersey. It was known as the Napahoke in the language of the Lenape. This entire region from the Kittatinny Mountains down to what is now Cape May were known among the various clans of the Lenape woodland Indians as Lenape Hoking, the place of the original people. Yes, Lenape among Native Americans meant original people so that many other tribes that were in vicinities adjacent to Lenapahoking considered them a tribe that went back further than their own separate cultures. So even within the native people, uh, the Lenapes were considered among the oldest. In South Jersey in Cumberland County and Bridgeton, in their library, um, I won't show the video, but they have over 30,000 Native American artifacts, which not only include arrowheads, which frequently among anthropologists, the shape will tell you how old it is from what period, and uh, stone tools, uh, fragments of uh, pottery and so forth. So these were people that were in existence for centuries, going back long before the Viking times, long back 12,000 years ago. We don't even have records of Europe that far back. This, uh, th these two statues, and there is a memorial to a Native American in Burlington County. His name was Okanikon. Okanikon was like Chief Oratom, he was a promoter of getting along with the 
new settlers. In this case, they were uh, Quaker settlers that had come to settle in West Jersey. Uh, he often was an arbiter whenever there were disagreements between his people and the local settlers. And he is, and this is most unusual, he is actually buried in the Quaker meeting burial cemetery. And that's what that plaque is memorializing. There are pl other places around the state that you can visit that are reminders of native culture. Um, you can go of all places. Patterson is a place known for, for its industrial development and industrial era. Uh, it was a place where steam engines and locomotives and Colt 45s and all manner of manufactured goods, silks, uh, were all manufactured in Patterson. But at their industrial museum, they have a segment of the museum set aside where you can see both artifacts, true artifacts, and simulated relics that are give you a sense of the people who once lived in the region. Of course, the dynamo that is the city of Patterson was largely due to the prominence of the Great Falls. And yet here is a photo, here is a, an art picture that you will see of the Great Falls on the left, shown with native people uh, fishing and spending a day in the summertime, um, taking care of children at the base of the Great Falls, which you can visit here on the right. Remember the Great Falls didn't come into prominence until Washington and Lafayette camped out not far away. And it was Lafayette that looked upon those falls and saw potential, potential for what would become not only America's, but New Jersey's first industrial site. But that's history for another time. We're talking about Native Americans. And this portrait on the left is one of two that was done by an early colonial painter by the name of Gustav Helsius, who personally interviewed and had chieftains sit for him. And he painted this in the late 1600s. And on the right is what I consider a, an undesignated monument. If you go to the town of Waterloo, there is a Lenape village that's been carved out into a secluded spot of the town of Stanhope. In fact, I came upon it not even knowing it was there, and I felt like I had walked into a time machine. This has been created by the son of Dobert, Dr. Herbert Kraft, who was a well-known anthropologist here in New Jersey, uh, the late Dr. Herbert Kraft. He has written many books and done much research on the anthropology of the early Northern New Jersey Minisink tribes and quite an expert even today, his references are used by anthropologists. His son who is also an anthropologist is the one that created this village. And what you see the representations and I walked in, there weren't even any interpreters there. I just walked in and knew immediately. I had like gone back in time 300 years. There are domiciles there, there are huts. There's a weir in the stream where you can see fishing taking place. And when you see no people there, it's kind of uncanny like they left and here you are still witnessing uh, that period of time. I hope it's still being kept up. Um, the state park uh, is a little rough around the edges, but that is a treasure right here in New Jersey. And while we're talking about the Lenape, you know, we have New Jersey's known for its highways. There's always Route 1. And in other parts, you'll see here references to, oh, that's the old King's Highway. And many of the roads and pathways 
that were first begun in New Jersey actually started out as Native American trails, which later settlers used not only to find places to settle, but to use as a way of linking one settlement with another. So when it talks about, and there are signs around the state referring to the Minisink Trail, uh, the Native Americans that were living out there near Stanhope, uh, out there near Alamucky, well, they traveled every year just like we do right down to the seashore. They often went down to uh, the Raritan Valley, um, took, there are several mini sink trails that have been traced. This is an early map uh, and they would often go fishing uh, with the seasons, they would spend their time at the seashore um, for food and, of course, better weather. Um, this is the inset of one of those maps, and you see old place names and current place names, but we'll be learning about a lot more of those soon. Don't discount your state museum because they do have an anthropology, you know, this is the most unusual state museum. It's state owned, it's not a separate institution. And it almost is overwhelming because they have so much here that you can be researching porcelains that were made in Trenton, um, the, the early uh, settlements uh, and Indian people of New Jersey or the dinosaurs, I mean, it's a place that is uh, very broad. So my suggestion is uh, if you want to delve into one segment at a time, you will find that there's lots to rediscover in Trenton at uh, the New Jersey State Museum. That being said, we're not talking about a culture that's dead and passed away in the past. Uh, yes, their numbers were depleted. Many migrated further west. Uh, there were Indian wars that were instigated by competition from France um, in the colonial period, but Native Americans are still here. And while they are not a dominant culture any longer uh, within the land of Lenahoke, uh, Napahoking, they are definitely a contributor to the cultural diversity of New Jersey. And we certainly want to remember that. Drums representing Mother Earth and the heartbeat of the nation set rhythms for hours of dancing at the annual Nanticoke Lenny Lenape powwow. Our dance is one of the most sacred things the native people have. And it's our voice to the creators, voice to the people. I've had people walk up to me after I dance. It was in tears. Brooks and fiance Emily Jeffries are the head dancers at this year's powwow. They're positions of tremendous honor. None of the dancers will enter the circle until we've entered this circle first. Uh, we're also part of the honor guard at the beginning of the powwow. Powwows are living events, not reenactments. At the core, they're spiritual celebrations. For me, every step is a prayer because we don't dance for ourselves, we dance for others, we dance for the ones that don't dance anymore, we dance for our children, we dance for our soldiers. And while there are basic steps learned in childhood, nothing is choreographed. You can't choreograph a prayer. So when you truly pray to, pray to creator, your dance steps represent you. You're actually speaking in your own language to him. Because it's a ceremony of religious importance and there's a long history of cultural misrepresentation, the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape Tribal Nation provides background information on their website and introduces prayers, dances, and traditions to attendees. And we see again this beautiful beadwork that represents something about them as a person or perhaps the heir of the country. Etiquette basics are posted so non-Native members of the public feel informed and welcome. 
educating school children and the public is a big focus of the event. We weren't allowed to be native. In 1924 is when we got our citizenships. 1978 is when we were allowed to practice our religion. So when we used to have our ceremonies, we used to have a guard out at the end of the driveway to the street. A lot of people, what they know of native natives is that, you know, from late night reruns of the Lone Ranger. And it's it is great that the public does come out and are interested in being educated and finding out what Native culture is really about. Powwows are also an opportunity for Native Americans to celebrate and learn about their own heritage. Lance Kelly is Navajo from Arizona. This is his first year joining his dad to travel down the East Coast, selling handmade items over the course of several months on what some refer to as the powwow trail. This is actually the way that we make a living. It's, it's something that we do that uh, preserves our culture because a lot of the youth is actually forgetting. My family's done this for over 30 years, and I'm one of the ones, I guess, that's going to keep it going, I hope. Kelly is in good company. Members of about 25 tribes gather to sing, drum, dance, celebrate, and educate. And while Gould says his tribe still occasionally runs into challenges with the government, he says they've come a long way. We're a loving tribe and we are surviving. The annual powwow has passed, but lessons on the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape can be found in the tribe's online museum and in the next year or so in a brick and mortar one as well. In Woodstown, I'm Maddie Orton for NJTV News. Now, Woodstown is in South Jersey, but most certainly uh, North Jersey has its Native American presence as well. And um, in addition to learning about uh, place names that exist that are all derived from Native American names here in New Jersey, and uh, the, uh, the interesting uh, cultural mores of Native Americans who certainly are for the most part, uh, you know, most of them go to jobs like you and I do and uh, have not separatists from uh, the society for the most part here in the East, uh, unlike the reservations that exist out in, in the West, which is somewhat different. Um, I am very hopeful uh, that individuals like Chief Vincent Mann here, uh, who is the chief of the Lenny Lenape Turtle Clan, uh, which comes out of Mawa, New Jersey. Um, he is focused on um, like helping people become conservation conscious, environmentally conscious. Uh, Native Americans have always had a reverence uh, towards the landscape uh, and everything within it, the, uh, the animals, the birds, uh, the fish, even though they may hunt them, uh, they respect them. They know that overfishing is actually, it, it's the wrong thing to do from their standpoint of philosophy and teaching. And I am very hopeful um, that uh, Chief Vincent and others like him have helped bring uh, environmental awareness uh, to our state park system, uh, to arborists around the state. And he recently was involved in helping dedicate a tree, uh, seedlings from what was New Jersey's oldest tree, uh, the Salem Oak from Salem, New Jersey which came down in 2019. And yet acorns from the previous year had been harvested and about 50 communities in New Jersey are replanting seedlings from that tree. And he was very instrumental in doing this up in North Jersey uh, with local townships. This is that tree that actually goes back to before 1676, this was a big oak tree, making it a monument for settlers that arrived in the town of Salem, creating the town of Salem in 1676. This was a monumental tree. Uh, in fact, 
great white oaks were native to New Jersey and many great white oaks, many of which have been harvested, covered the state. This particular one uh, is now another generation can be found, as I said, in about 40 towns around New Jersey. And that's a, that's a whole talk unto itself. But when we talk about Native Americans, and when we talk about America, we do, or we have been celebrating Columbus Day. Now, suddenly Columbus Day is a very controversial holiday, but I can't talk about early monuments without discussing it because it's important we come to grips with how we view our history. And if there are modifications due to actual scientific and academic inquiry that we arrive at other conclusions about our history, well, history is about facing the truth and suddenly we discover that Christopher Columbus was uh, a controversial figure. That's not to say that he shouldn't be celebrated, although why we celebrate him in New Jersey, he had nothing to do with New Jersey. He supposedly was credited with discovering America, but he didn't really discover America, he, he discovered the Caribbean. And, he thought he was discovering Asia at the same time. Uh, nevertheless, people latched on with great pride and uh, anticipation, since of course, after Columbus, there was renewed interest in the new world. And, but many people, particularly indigenous people, would suffer for it. So consequently, the statue you see on the right, uh, by the way, there was no Italy at the time. He was Genovese. Um, there were city-states around uh, the Italian peninsula and uh, he was working for Spain. <laughs> so as you will find out in other explorations of our region, uh, often it was, um, individuals from one country being hired by another country uh, to explore the potential of the new world. And Christopher Columbus certainly was credited with being early on that scene. The statue on the right was in Newark, New Jersey. And it has been there for years with great pride but recently, uh, and it was in installed back in 1927 of October, it may look a little older than that due to the vertebrae. Uh, it has interesting panels on it that still stand, but the statue was taken down at midnight a couple of years ago because of the outcry that many, particularly indigenous people, have been saying that why are we celebrating um, Christopher Columbus when we should be celebrating uh, maybe Indigenous Peoples Day. And that is a conversation that in my view should continue. I think both sides have a great deal to contribute uh, to examine history as it happened, um, facing up to history. Uh, unfortunately, Columbus has other trappings that are linking him in ways that make him a figure that perhaps he is not deserving of. And this other people have to come to grips with. Italian Americans have often celebrated him because he was like the first Italian speaking person who went to the new world and started uh, the great North American experiment. But I don't think in New Jersey that's as important as others that actually came to New Jersey or witnessed New Jersey. On the other hand, this statue on the left is also in New York, Newark, but after the statues, many statues, not all of them, but many Christopher Columbus statues have either been voluntarily removed 
or have been violently removed because of controversy. The one you saw on the left, which was in front of the Italian American newspaper, mysteriously disappeared and reappeared in a place that is almost fitting. It's in Sussex County, outside of the ballpark and outside of the stadium in Sussex County is this enormous steel globe that is maybe 30, 40 feet high. And you see both in this picture. So it, it uh, gives new purpose to the Christopher Columbus um, story, uh, but linked to exploration and not necessarily exploitation. But at the same time, we should view the issue uh, amongst ourselves um, because for some people, it is certainly a controversial issue. And here is that in a nutshell. I admire him for his honesty and his logic because a lot of people would say they want to stop at one set of statutes. They may well do, but once you open this conversation, once you approach the subject from the principle of let us eradicate those things from the past that were morally wrong and are unacceptable today, then you cannot stop indeed at Confederate statues. You put everything on the table. The problem with that is you end up uh, creating quite an artificial sense of what the past was. You try to cleanse it of all things that make no sense morally to us today. And therefore you rewrite people's past and you, you create a, a past which simply wasn't real. You're rewriting the past. Not at all. I think a lot of these move. Now they're talking about um, the other statues which have recently been by public protest, Confederate statues, which have caused similar um, discussions and protests. Uh, but the controversy is the same. Do you keep the same statues and, and then have a means of dialogue about it even criticizing the individual that the statue may be, or do you end up eradicating it? I'm not going to continue with the controversy only because we have so much material to cover. By the way, on the right, this is a bust of Christopher Columbus that's still standing in Patterson, and it's by Gaetano Federici, who was literally the resident sculptor in the town of Patterson. There are probably 20 or 30 works of his throughout that town. And uh, the statue still stands. As for the one in Newark, it's gone. And uh, it will be replaced by a very modern statue celebrating um, Miss Tubman. However, you don't necessarily, to talk about discovery of the new world, have to have an individual that's highlighted. Uh, I have crossed out here. Uh, you'll see towns that have had their statues removed, their Columbus statues removed. Uh, there may be a few that I missed, but I wanted to only highlight that we have some monuments that are non-figurative monuments that are representative of the accomplishment of discovery of the new world and the promise of the new world. And they are um, in these four towns. There's one that, that's quite striking, uh, the sale of Columbus. And this was done in Genoa, Italy. Uh, it stands about 70 feet high. It's in Jersey City. Uh, this one was a student commission from Union County College showing the hand and the earth and uh, these from Ocean Township and Passaic Counties. Now, coming up, a celebration you've probably not heard about and even in 2024, you may not hear about. It's the 500th anniversary of the discovery of what would become New Jersey. And that wasn't Christopher Columbus, that was Verrazzano. Verrazzano, the son of a noble family near Florence. He was Giovanni da Verrazzano, and he's the one that passed through this way. 
And this was, of course, a bridge has been dedicated uh, that links Staten Island with uh, Long Island. Uh, there is a statue of him. Uh, the original statue was supposed to be created for the uh, Fulton Hudson Jubilee by a New Jersey sculptor, Carl Bitter. But when he passed away, uh, another, we, another sculptor was chosen and this statue sits down at Battery Park in New York. This of course is a figure from Europe that should be remembered because he too, as well as America Vespucci, uh, were responsible for the North American continent awareness. And keep this in mind, when Verrazano came to North America and explored our coastline, while he may have been a Florentine, he wrote everything in French because he was working on behalf of Francis I, King of France. And it was the King of France who was interested in North America. And that voyage goes back to 1524, a hundred years before the Dutch would be sailing up the Delaware River. So let's talk about the bragging rights that are deserving here between the, what we call today the Hudson and the Delaware. The Henry Hudson Monument, well, there are several in New York State, but we have one in New Jersey. It's in Jersey City. There's a bust of Henry Hudson on a tall concrete pedestal uh, in a park. He too was an Englishman working for the Dutch back when the English found out that uh, he had been exploring on behalf of the Dutch. Uh, they prohibited him from ever going back uh, to, to work for the Dutch. And they confiscated many of his, um, the things that he brought back from his first exploration of the Hudson River Valley. When he arrived, remember he arrived so early, this was at a time when uh, exploration was just being done by the English down in Virginia. And at the same time, he was here looking at what was to be what he named the North River and the Delaware he would name the South River. So that's just before other Dutchmen are sent back to pick up where he, an Englishman, had left off. So we have Dutch exploration, as you learned about this woman, Sarah Kierstad, there were settlers already along the western shore of the Hudson as early as 1618. That meant that New Amsterdam had already been established and was the base of operations for further exploration of what I spoke about as the peninsula here of New Jersey. So is there any evidence of this? What do we know? Well, I only take to the southern tip of New Jersey. What is the name of that Cape? The name of that Cape is Cape May. Let's see here. And here we have a monument, a monument that most people, even in Camden County, which this monument is standing in, don't even know about. The monument was erected back in the 1920s. Uh, and it's actually celebrating um, the arrival of the Captain Cornelius Jacobson May, spelled M-E-Y. The English went and changed it to M-A-Y later. He was the first one that explored on the ship whale, Volvis means whale. That ship would sail up what they called the South River and extend all the way up to just short of this spot which is where the Verrazano Narrows, rather where the uh, Walt Whitman Bridge crosses over into Pennsylvania, where 
Big Timber Creek can be found on the map, they established in 1623 their first fort. And when I say fort, this is like a dozen guys that get together, put up a stockade and do some trading with local Indians. They did not bring settlers. And this fort ultimately would eventually be evacuated. But further, further up river, there had been exploration back in 1624 at a place that, yeah, you can even visit today. The place is called Burlington Island. The Dutch called it High Island because it really stood out in height above the waterline. It's where the Burlington Bristol Bridge is located across the Delaware from Bristol, Pennsylvania. In 1624, after May had discovered this island, Walloons who were French speaking, but came from a small principality, uh, Walloons came and settled here for a year, hoping to generate trade, ongoing trade with the natives. But they were unsuccessful. In fact, they felt so abandoned that they went back to New Amsterdam. That was in 1624. Now, meanwhile, the Dutch had not given up on the Delaware Valley because the Delaware Valley had Native Americans that were um, willing to trade for furs. Furs was the big thing in the earliest years of New Amsterdam. And the person behind much of the ongoing exploration and exploitation of both the Hudson River Valley and the Delaware Valley was also a Walloon. A Walloon that we all know by the name of, well, we say Peter Minuit, but his name was French and it's Peter Minui, which means midnight. So Captain Midnight is the one that negotiated the purchase of Manhattan. And everyone says, yeah, it was for 24, $29 worth of trinkets. But it was for trade goods and the Native Americans uh, were very happy with the exchange for what they did not understand is that they were giving exclusive rights to Europeans who understood the issue of real property Native Americans didn't understand native uh, ownership of land. That was the great spirit that owned land. They were giving you an entitlement to also use the land. So from their standpoint, using financial jargon, they were providing a lease rather than a purchase. And it was very difficult for other generations of Native Americans uh, to realize that there was a discrepancy uh, between the two interpretations of what those early treaties were. Peter Minuit also, because he had worked with uh, Captain May and other explorers, um, uh, he knew all about the characteristics of the Delaware Valley or the South River Valley, as they called it. But when he had a uh, disc when he had a falling out with management back in old Amsterdam, and they fired him, and they fired him after um, there was the discrepancy. Was he selling? Was he? holding back on the furs uh, for private um, distribution, or was he selling everything back to uh, the Dutch trading company? And uh, we never really know the facts of that discrepancy. Nevertheless, Peter Minuit being out of a job, went to the Swedes and said, I have a proposal to make. In the meantime, 
down south, further south, at the mouth of the Delaware Bay, the Dutch West Trading Company decided upon what looked like the perfect corporate proposal. In fact, if you had been a potential investor in old Amsterdam and you had heard about this, you would have wanted in on what looked on paper like the perfect exploitation of the South River Valley. It was to be called a place called picturesquely Schwanendale, the Valley of the Swans. And here was the plan, this great Dutch investment. And there were two, there was gonna be one in Cape May, but the pilot project was on the Delaware side. Schwanendale was to provide three things. The ship Derval would come and supply an entire settlement, not of men and women, but just men and workers that would be there for a year. And then of course, the supply ship would return. They would grow that wonderful cash crop that they had learned about from Native Americans that was selling like hotcakes in Europe, tobacco. It was all the vogue in upper courts around all of Europe. They couldn't get enough of it and were willing to pay high prices for it. But you had to have certain conditions to be able to grow it. And at first, it was only the Virginians that had a corner on that market. And the Dutch, of course, won nothing to do with trading for it if they could make their own. So they would produce their own plantation. They would also trade with Native Americans uh, down there at the mouth of the Delaware and by boat up further upriver towards Wilmington and maybe even as far as Burlington. Remember Burlington is a hundred miles from the ocean. Philadelphia is 80 miles from the ocean. Wilmington is another 20 some miles further south. So, you know, the Delaware was upriver with a lot of potential and they thought, will corner the market. And the third thing, like the name of the ship was, twice a year, whales, even today, pass the mouth of the, Del the Delaware Bay. And it meant that they could exploit whaling close into shore and be able to render these whales into a big cash crop, which of course would be whale oil and all of the other things that a whale could produce. On paper, it was magnificent. Schwanendale was set up and it looked like it was going to be a rousing success story. However, a disagreement with the local Nanticoke tribe over something quite trivial ended up having all of the Dutchmen that were at Schwanendale wiped out. And when the, when the ship came back, expecting the load of whale oil, furs, and tobacco, there was no one left. And it was, uh, when they discovered what the incident was, it was over such a trivial matter, but only a small group of Indians had taken umbrage from an insult and had wiped them all out. That meant that when Peter Minui was looking for knowing the potential of the South River, he went to another Protestant um, empire of Europe at the time. Sweden was a much larger country. It included all of the Baltic, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, parts of Poland. One reason was because the King of Sweden had been the champion in the Thirty Years' War for the Protestant cause. And so he was extremely influential. And Peter Minuet figured, 
I can convince them that they should have investments in the new world. And I know the countryside. I've seen the maps. I know the captains who've been there. I even know the names of the Native Americans. And with that, a Swedish West India Trading Company was founded. And Peter Minuit in 1638 founded a new colony. Before I do that, I want to point out that the Dutch, we must not underrate the Dutch presence. Our textbooks really minimize it because, of course, we ultimately became an English colony. And yet all these names and more are names you recognize. New Yorkers fail to mention how Dutch the western side of the uh, of the North River was, but these are all community names that were part of what was New, New Holland or New Netherlands here. Getting back to our story, oh, and another aspect before I go from Dutch to Swedish. If you go to Rutgers University, you will find on the campus of Rutgers what seems a strange statue. It's a statue of William the Silent, also known as William of Orange Nassau. You remember the name of the, the fort that was down there in South Jersey? It was called Fort Nassau. And he goes back to the 1500s. Why would his statue be here at Rutgers University? Well, the Holland Society of New York, which certainly um, represents the proud heritage of Dutch contribution to American society, felt that there was no more appropriate statue to place in New Jersey as a reminder of independence and America's independence against a much larger country like Great Britain it was William of Orange who was the champion of independence of the lower countries the, of Netherlands that was the one that rebelled successfully against Spain. It's very easy to forget that Spain dominated the lowlands for many, many years. And it was the Dutch independence movement headed up by William the Silent that gave them individual identity and then reunited the various provinces into what became a very strong and influential international trading company, country. So we go from Zwanendale, which had no longer succeeded, to this new place called Fort Christina, which is where um, Peter Minuit had established a fort in 1638 with two ships that had arrived from the trading company of Sweden. And this would mean that now Sweden was laying claim to the, the abandoned, because Fort Nassau had already been abandoned, doing trade with Native Americans, first only on the Western side, and then by 1643 with their own governor arriving and a new seat of government in what is now called Tinicum, which is in Pennsylvania. Colonies on the Western or Eastern side, known as New Stockholm and Swedesboro, and even a Fort Ellsborg which is in Ellsboro Township, um, Cumberland County, these towns sprung up and they were predominantly Swedes and Finns that literally laid claim to becoming the first permanent settlements of West Jersey or even South Jersey. Now you will hear often 
West Jersey and South Jersey used interchangeably. But the term West Jersey is because of how the state would eventually be subdivided. This individual stayed for 10 years. His name was Johan Prince. And he, a military man from Sweden, established a very strong presence. And when the Dutch tried to reassert on several occasions their importance in this region or their claim, there was often friction between them, but it did not become a shooting war until after Johann Prince left in 1640, uh, 1653. Then, of course, everything changed when Peter Stuyvesant, as you, a name you remember, uh, made his presence felt. But meanwhile, from 1638 to 1655, pretty much on their own, 12 ships. Now, meanwhile, Sweden is having uh, confrontations with Denmark. It's allying with France against England. Um, so there are two years that go by, not a supply ship shows up in South Jersey. And yet these Swedes and Finns stay. And there are people in South Jersey even today that are linked to that early presence. And because of that early presence and the existence on the New Jersey side of Fort Mosquito, the river was controlled and dominated by the Swedes until 1655. Peter Stuyvesant, who of course we all know, he was a presence well known in New York. He was a presence certainly well known in North Jersey. And in 1655, he made his presence unofficially without the approval of old Amsterdam, he said, I've had enough. The Swedes are selling, are buying furs from the, uh, from the English at prices we don't want to pay. In other words, the Swedes were out competing the Dutch. Um, they had to periodically trade with the Swedes. And it was controversial because both of their federal governments in the home country um, were relying on each other as allies or suppliers. So they didn't want any ruckus in the new world. So this controversy was always tamped down until 1655 when Peter Stuyvesant, there's this absolutely, I've seen other statues in New York state. They haven't, they don't hold a candle to this magnificent statue that's in Jersey City that has been relocated and refurbished. It was originally dedicated in 1913. It's now outside the Culinary Arts Plaza at Hudson County Community College. It is magnificent. It's one of the best sculptors of that period in, in um, our regional history. J. Massey Rind uh, is, was world renowned. And this statue shows the character and the figure of Stuyvesant even better than the portraits that existed from his own time do. And he went down and he, with all his manpower that he could muster and all the gunpowder that he could muster, he brought about six ships and he fired several cannon shots and the Swedes said, wait a minute, you're destroying everything. They surrendered and then during the negotiations, the peace negotiations against the then governor of New Sweden, a runner who has run across the state of New Jersey and arrived informing Peter Stuyvesant of news back home that he had to return. The negotiations were very hurried. And he said, look, you have to agree, you Swedes and Finns, have to agree if you are willing 
I am willing to let you continue your church, your traditions, your trading arrangements, any uh, trade that you do uh, with your home country. However, you are now um, beholden as, as uh, citizens of New Amsterdam and you are considered Swedes under the Dutch flag. And if you are willing to do that, I will leave you in peace. And the reason was he had to get back to New Amsterdam because New Amsterdam had been raided by Indians and there were no, no soldiers there to protect the settlement of New Amsterdam. And half of it was burned to the ground, which meant, of course, Peter Stuyvesant had some explaining to do uh, because of course he was working for the Dutch West India Company. Now there is a monument in South Jersey uh, that is only 18 years old. I was involved with its dedication. Uh, it has three sides to it. Um, it is a monument that is on the Jersey side celebrating New Sweden. And it is in Pennsville, Salem County. And what was so important at this dedication was that Native Americans from the local Nanticoke Lenape tribe uh, wished voluntarily to participate in its dedication because the Swedes and the, and the uh, Finns were well known for their hospitality and reasonableness. Um, Johann Prince on the other side of the river uh, had a different attitude about Indians, but on this side of the river, uh, like the town of Salem's name that hadn't arrived yet, it was a very peaceful settlement. And the only thing, the, the big controversy between Native Americans and the Swedes that were living among them with farmstead settlements was that they let their pigs out free. And of course the pigs would go off and forage uh, on, on the crops that the natives had been planting. So once that was figured out, there was considerable peace. A local artist did these two medallions that can be seen on that monument that really tell the story of recognition all the time that the Swedes recognized this as the land of the Lenape. And because of that, they viewed themselves as being uh, hospitable uh, caretakers. And it was a joint venture. Uh, they also had interesting similarities. These were not settlers from the city of Stockholm. These were country folk. So they were used to country ways. And in fact, some of them were sent because they had been foraging against the royal forests of Sweden and were sent there as a penalty. But um, they had much in common. One thing I felt quite in common, we all know of the Swedish and Norwegian, all Scandinavian Jews saunas and Native Americans were very big on a sweat lodge uh, as a means of purifying the body. Um, also, the early settlements of South Jersey originally had to go to church on the western side of the South River. They too called it the South River, although used the word South in Swedish. Until one December, um, one of their boats, one of their church boats going across the river vanished uh, during a storm and uh, the church raised money so that they themselves would be able to eventually build their own church. So while Pennsylvania has its oldest church in Pennsylvania is a Swedish church, that's Old Swedes Church in Philadelphia. There's 1699 and 1700, the Old Swedes Church in Wilmington, the Old Swedish Churches of Swedesboro, and down in Pennsville were also log cabin churches that have been brought to the present day and are now uh, existing churches, 
not directly linked to Sweden, uh, but still have a Swedish flag by the pulpit um, and are now considered Episcopal churches. There are semblances of reminders of the, this early period in South Jersey. Most have not heard of a cabin that exists in South Jersey. It's the oldest cabin in America. It's C.R. North Nagel's log cabin, and it has been dated back to 1643. They furnished it, but they added an addition next to it. Uh, it's in Greenwich, Gloucester County, New Jersey, which is south of where uh, the original Dutch settlement had been, uh, not Dutch settlement, but temporary Dutch Fort Nassau. Um, and this building is still standing. There are other buildings in South Jersey that go back to the 1690s. Uh, some domiciles have been interwoven into, pre, into existing farmsteads and other buildings were outbuildings uh, that have been saved. Uh, this building is made of, of uh, oak, white oak timbers. Uh, other outbuildings are made of Eastern white cedar. So the linkage of South Jersey and its early Swedish presence has been memorialized and paid tribute to on several occasions. Most noteworthy was in 1988, uh, the King and Queen of Sweden came to South Jersey. They visited Trenton as well. Uh, they visited Trenton during 70, uh, 1976, but they actually came down to South Jersey and in tribute to their arrival, uh, artisans from Sweden were sent ahead with the sponsorship of local sponsorship. At first it was gonna be in Salem, and then it was decided it would be in Bridgeton that had more space to provide. An entire farmstead was constructed in the old manufacturing style using local logs here, uh, but done even with a grass roof top, uh, a grass roof top, uh, and uh, the old notching, which meant the Swedish, when they built their log cabins, they didn't even use chinking. That's how tightly they fit the logs. And you see examples here. Unfortunately, about 13 years later, the park gave up in supporting the ongoing maintenance of it, and it was broken down and shipped off hope with the hopes and expectation of being able to be built somewhere else. And that dream has actually happened. And it has been reconstituted at the very place, which is a township park on the other side of the river in Tinicum Township. And it's now, and it's been known as uh, Governor Prince Park, it has been reconstituted as a new outdoor, free interpretive outdoor museum. It's not done in exactly the same style. Uh, the buildings are the same shape. The roofs and the chinking are not Swedish authentic, but the buildings represent the lifestyle of the late and mid 16. 1600s. And on special weekends, this interpretive site is manned by volunteers from both sides of the river. I should point out that that early Swedish and uh, Finnish history of South Jersey uh, has been memorialized and was first published about uh, at the early turn of the last century, uh, when a professor, Amandus Johnson, who was born in Sweden, became a University of Pennsylvania professor, and he ended up interpreting all the documents related to the presence of New Sweden. And because of that, a museum in Philadelphia, which still stands today, was founded in 1926. And you can learn about 
not only that early colonial period, but you can learn about the Swede, Swedish contribution to America ever since. And this is just a close up of the interior of that museum. The interior, of course, has this one section that talks about both sides of the Delaware Valley. You see, the point I'm trying to get to is that much of New Jersey's history can also be found outside of New Jersey. And here is my case in point. In North Jersey, you find stories about Bergen County in New Netherlands of North Jersey in New York. And here in Philadelphia is the only place you're going to find large placards that are mounted on City Hall in Philadelphia that's showing you, yes, they consider it Commonwealth of Pennsylvania history, but New Netherlands and New Sweden, which is part of New Jersey, is showing each of the governors that lay claim to being part of New Jersey, what became New Jersey. That's the next quick chapter of our story. Oh, by the way, uh, if you get to visit Philadelphia looking for that New Jersey story, here is how, this is the ship that brought the first settlers that would end up becoming part of South Jersey. This was their first book. We really can't hear the uh, what if if they're speaking with the video. This is a reproduction. This is the tall ship of Delaware, but it's actually a part of the story of New South Jersey because this ship made several voyages bringing immigrants to South Jersey that would become permanent settlers. And you can see this ship, you can even sail on it uh, by special reservation. Uh, this ship was built uh, and is on display in Wilmington next to that first Fort Christina or the site of Peter Minuit's settlement and the creation of the new Sweden settlement. Now the part of our history books that they remember. Meanwhile, back in England, there had been a civil war. And after that civil war and the King of England had been executed and uh, Oliver Primwell had uh, died uh, and it was determined by parliament that they would restore the King, Charles II becomes King of England. And James, the Duke of York, uh, a name very important in the Hudson Valley, uh, becomes his right hand. He becomes co-owner of what would eventually become English territory. How did that happen? Well, you remember what happened to the Swedes when one day unexpectedly without provocation, Peter Stuyvesant showed up well, one day without provocation, but a lot of long range planning, a ship secretly leaves England. In fact, it left leaving rumors among the diplomatic corps that the Duke of York was interested in going to colonies in the Gold Coast of West Africa. But the soldiers on board actually had, an, had other orders, which they themselves did not know. The ship sailed to Boston and Boston thought, oh my goodness, here we have, uh, we've got a problem. Uh, we're not keeping, our governor is not keeping up with what is expected of us back in England. But all they did was recruit additional soldiers and then sail down the coast unexpectedly in 1664 and show up at the doorstep 
of Peter Stuyvesant. And Peter Stuyvesant was really caught with his, with his, literally with his powder dry, dry, his powder wet. His powder wasn't dry. His powder had been saturated by a recent flood. He couldn't get volunteers corralled to face these ships that are out in the harbor. Uh, they landed first on Staten Island and laid claim to Staten Island. And they gave Peter Stuyvesant an ultimatum that it would be shock and awe for New Amsterdam uh, if he tried to resist. And so in 1664, Peter Stuyvesant had to resign and suddenly the flag of England was raised over New Amsterdam and the Duke of York immediately named it New York and uh, the rest they say is history. Well, it wasn't all that simple. Of course, this meant that the Swedes who were now Dutch and the Dutch who were, had considered themselves Dutch all along uh, were suddenly English subjects. And they had been given terms that their rights to the land, the land that they possessed, that would still be recognized. They had the right to leave or they had the right to stay and become English subjects, which most did. In South Jersey, there were very few people that left. In New York, on the other hand, many officials of the Dutch government left and went back to New Netherlands. Peter Stuyvesant himself had to go back uh, to a very embarrassing uh, legal inquiry of explanation. Uh, there were protests from court to court between governments, but the, uh, the English did not renege and they laid permanent claim uh, to New Amsterdam, now called New York. Now renaming the North River, although parts of it were still called the North River, uh, renaming the North River um, after Henry Hudson, who was an Englishman who had been working for the Dutch. Uh, New York, as I said, became New York. Now, only among academicians does another glitch take place in our history, an inconvenient truth. After all the documents of ownership had been changed from Dutch to English, and in fact, the land in New Jersey had already been given to two noblemen. And the land of New Jersey was suddenly called New Jersey, and it was to go to these two noblemen who were known as Carteret and Barclay. They were given joint ownership of what was to be called New Caesarea or New Jersey. The name New Caesarea never stuck, although it did show up on early coinage. However, these two proprietors were given this land because the Duke of York and the king had no money. They wanted to export, they wanted New York. That was the prize. They could trade New York and make New York an instant royal colony. But as far as the treasury was concerned, they didn't have enough to establish a, an English bureaucracy. And so they wanted to use other people's money. And what better people to choose than two who were already proprietors with land interests in other colonies. Both of them had been royalists and supporters of the crown during the English Civil War. So it looked like a natural, but they weren't necessarily anxious to keep it. Meanwhile, that rather embarrassing Dutch transition that brought it about, well, 
the Dutch showed up with an armada of eight ships in 1672. And the English had to give back New York. And suddenly New York was rapidly named New Orange for of course the House of Orange. And all those documents that were suddenly English documents of title were null and void. And it reverted back to Dutch administration. But this did not last because the war between the English, the third Anglo-Dutch war was finally settled in 1674 and the Treaty of Westminster ended up giving back New York to New York. <laughs> and the Treaty of Westminster let the English um, give back, uh, let the Dutch keep some of the islands in the Caribbean. It looked like a pretty unequal trade, but what a mess that would make to the titles of the two early proprietors who suddenly uh, had their titles nullified and then they were reconstituted and both were elderly and Lord Barclay was the first that wanted out and to sell his share. Now, in order to subdivide New Jersey, uh, it's, a, it's pretty awkward when you haven't established counties and you don't know what the distribution of population is. So it was decided that it would be West Jersey, that would be a line diagonally struck from Barnegat Bay, which is now Ocean County, dividing across the state. And this part up here, well, this would be East Jersey, and this part would be West Jersey, which meant that parts of Sussex County, um, all the way down to what we know as Cape May County today, was West Jersey. And East Jersey would have its own central government in Perth Amboy, and West Jersey would be in Burlington. But that was only in the negotiating stage. Um, he did sell before he died in 1677. He sold his land to a group of Quakers in England. And the group of Quakers were having difficulty figuring out, well, who was gonna get how many shares in this new West Jersey proprietorship that they had gotten from the original proprietor. And when that was being sorted out because one owed another had a lien on property. So they decided that the original purchaser uh, would be entitled to less, but he would get the governorship. His name was Billings. And that uh, another uh, John Fenwick would only get 10%. Well, when he heard he was getting 10%, uh, the, the final agreement for the West Jersey proprietorship had not yet been hammered out by 1676. He said, I'm out of here. He convinced 20 families to join him and he went and settled the colony before it was sanctioned and started the town of Salem in 1677, which was actually before the final agreement of all the proprietors had been signed, which meant that he ended up serving two years in jail uh, in New York. Uh, meanwhile, the others had to fend for themselves and they finally sorted it out. And not only Salem was founded, but a year later, the town of Burlington was founded. And as I said, that was to be the capital. Now, why the name New Jersey? Well, it was the Carteret side of the, that two brief partnership of New Jersey because Carter, Carteret had been the principal, um, the Lord of the Manor and the principal of government for the protectorate that was known as the Island of Jersey. If you ever have an opportunity to visit, it's an interesting place. 
It's 43 miles from the coast, 43 miles from the coast of England, about nine miles from the coast of uh, France. And French is spoken there and French rules and governance is very much the style there. Nevertheless, it has been a protectorate all these years and been under the English flag and during the English Civil War, it was the stepping stone for asylum for the royals that got out of the country. And they, they went to safe haven here before they went to the Netherlands um, and finally to the court of France. So that's why it was called New Jersey in tribute to this safe sanctuary for the royals. Originally, this was with invasion from another direction. During Caesar's time, this briefly was called New Caesarea because it was the beginning of the invasion of Britain, uh, making Britain uh, part of the Roman Empire. Now, the Carteret family um, kept their half and began doling out portions of it. First, they wanted, uh, they got requests from pilgrims uh, that were coming from the English uh, in Connecticut. Uh, those pilgrims, uh, they were theocrats. Everything was being ruled by the church and some felt it was uh, a sterner interpretation than others. So some wanted to come and settle and in what would be their own theocracy, and Newark was founded. Uh, this is an interesting portrait. You can still see it in the Essex County Courthouse. Howard Pyle, a noted illustrator of Philip Carteret, who was a relative of the original um, Carteret. Um, the town of Carteret was named after um, Carteret's wife, Elizabeth, and He's establishing the, the East Jersey proprietorship. It was fraught with controversy because um, the deeds that were coming from the Duke of York uh, and had come from the Carterets uh, were not in alignment. And uh, Newark was being settled by dissenters that weren't agreeing with the early proprietors of of East Jersey, and East Jersey was more troublesome uh, for the proprietorship uh, than West Jersey. But both of them were problems for the, for the uh, monarchy. And it wasn't until 1702 that New Jersey ended up becoming a royal colony. And that's significant because now the treasury had the money to invest and the governors of New Jersey would end up being royal governors until independence. This is the little town of, uh, that John Fenwick started uh, in Salem, New Jersey. And these are places that you can visit. This is the tree that is no longer. Um, and this in the town of Burlington is a building that once housed the original documents. I've seen all of those original documents. Yes, even William Penn's signature is on it. He was an active pr pr proprietor in both East and West Jersey until he got Pennsylvania. And then he began to sell off his shares and interests in West Jersey. That's why if you go here again to the City Hall of Philadelphia, some say that there was a feud between Alexander Calder, the sculptor, who did the statue of William Penn, and he turned his face away from Philadelphia as an insult. I actually think it's much more symbolic. If you look at William Penn's gaze, he's looking upriver and he's looking straight to the small town of Burlington where he worshiped among 
the pen among the Quakers of the West Jersey proprietorship, where he owned land and interest and participated in West Jersey. Pennsylvanians are shocked to discover this. And of course, why did he get Pennsylvania? Well, the competition between England and the Netherlands was never on the ground. It was always on the high seas. And there were three major conflicts, Com competition between two Protestant states for global interests. Both England and the Netherlands were interested in dominating interests that had previously been explored by Portugal and Spain and were interested in growing colonies throughout the world. And this is why the competition and the naval engagements between England and Holland. Admiral Sir William Penn, who had served first in the Cromwellian Navy and then served under Charles II, was one of the leading architects of strategy against the Dutch Navy, making victory possible more times than defeat in those engagements, making it possible to lay claim eventually to the land between the English colony of Connecticut and the English colony of Maryland. I say that he's looking straight up river to the provincial capital of Burlington. And why would I say that? Well, because his house that he built where he intended to spend the rest of his life, but circumstances prohibited that from happening. This is a recreation of his house and it's located diagonally across the Delaware River from Burlington. It's actually across the river from Florence, New Jersey, but there is an island in between, so you cannot see it from New Jersey. But it is very close, a, a short horseback ride to ride and then or catch the ferry. You could take a sailboat and be from Pensbury, his Pensbury Manor, over to Burlington in a matter of maybe an hour of sailing. And that's assuming normal air. Surprised that he's a real estate tycoon in New Jersey? Well, I've got news for you. Two sites of governor mansions in New Jersey were purchased on land that originally was owned by William Penn. One is Morven and the other is Drumthwacket. So William Penn really had a stake and William Penn actually passed by this house that was built. Um, this house was part of the original government infrastructure, uh, Royal Governor infrastructure in the West Jersey proprietorship. It's, it was originally located right along the river on High Street and to save it from demolition, it was moved one block away and can still be visited. And the river, of course, the English had renamed the river before they claimed New York. On their maps that showed the South River, they showed this as the Delaware, named after Thomas West, who was the Baron de la War, who was responsible, the third Baron de la War, who rescued what was a failing colony in Jamestown from total collapse. If the ships that had come to rescue the colony had not arrived, they too would have been a missing colony like Roanoke. Real quickly, I want to touch on just a couple of other residences. Interesting thing about this house that you can visit in Trenton, it was the house of three governors. Most importantly to that early history, it was the residence of the first 
royal governor that was not a royal governor of New York at the same time, but a separate royal governor of New Jersey. And his name was Lewis Morris. We have Morristown and Morris County. Um, he was the first one that pointed out to the bureaucrats back in London, listen, if you're going to have royal governors, they have to have a stake and a presence in New Jersey. They cannot be absentee governors. The rest of the history of this house, this house was first built by William Trent, a contemporary of William Penn. And ironically, William Penn rented the house that William Trent owned in Philadelphia while his own house was being built in, at Pensbury. Here we pay tribute to Lewis Morris, the governor gov governors I won't mention, uh, but they all are place names that you will recognize here in New Jersey. I wanna wrap up with the last royal governor that we recognize his father's name. He was the kid in those electric experiments with lightning. He was his clerk when Ben Franklin was the biggest political adversary of the Penn proprietorship during the administration of Penn's um, progeny, his sons and grandsons. Um, he was the one that ultimately uh, broke away from proprietary, uh, William Franklin was unwilling uh, to break away during the rumblings of independence. And he ended up being uh, in this very building. This building is the only existing original governor build, uh, colonial government building from the colonial period of the 13 original states. It still stands. It's had many different purposes, uh, but proprietary house is in part still preserved as the only government building left of the 13 original colonies. All of the others, including Williamsburg, are recreations. This is an original. It shows that in the 1650s, when, this, when money was generated by the, by the uh, royal administration back in London, during the period of confrontation throughout North America with the French, um, this was a symbol of government. This is where William Franklin took the oath of office but he had two places where he was governor. He was governor of two Jerseys. He was governor of East Jersey and he was governor of West Jersey. That means that if you go to Burlington, uh, there is no building, there is a building where proprietary house once stood in Burlington. Then a Victorian building was built on the same site. That building was raised except for the first floor and is now a VFW social hall, but the site still stands as the, and he had a farm in what is Willingboro today where there is a sign where he was a resident of Burlington County, but also lived in North Jersey. After he was arrested by Major Livingston, who would become the first New Jersey uh, government as an independent state, um, he eventually, his father wouldn't get, get him out of jail. Uh, they broke on the issue of independence. Uh, and after he finally was released, he ended up continuing uh, royalist militia activities out of uh, Manhattan. And uh, the two would finally meet again later in London at the time that Franklin went to England during negotiations uh, with England during the peace treaty, um, but they really never came to terms. However, we have to be thankful to him because if it hadn't been for William Franklin, you would have never, the 
autobiography by William Franklin would have never seen a publisher and we would not have been able to read it. Now, I'm moving very close to the close of our story today. Um, but here in New Jersey on July 2nd, 1776, New Jersey's government declared itself free and independent by way of New Jersey's constitution, which you may hear more about soon when your next speaker comes. However, it, um, this skirmish, which is done annually at a very historic site that was built in 1750 when New Jersey was still a royal colony, this was the old Indian Tavern. And it's one of the few buildings that the New Jersey Park Service maintains in a manner that I have to say is laudable. The others always seem to need more funding or there are reasons why their portions of another site that they manage can't be viewed. But this is spectacular. So when you're in South Jersey, by all means visit the 1750 Indian King Tavern in Haddonfield. It's right on King's Highway, which is the name of the main street that goes through Haddonfield. And within this tavern, in this tavern, on the second floor was where they decided in 1777 that all documents relating to the province of New Jersey would no longer use that nomenclature, but use the word state. And the state of New Jersey itself was therefore came to pass in written documents henceforth. Also designed in this building was this symbol, which you see on the state flag. And it was designed and the design was accepted right there in the, the, uh, the tavern in Haddonfield. And it was by an immigre from Switzerland by the name of Pierre Eugene de Cimetière, and he ended up becoming, uh, he, he died in poverty, but he was the first archivist for the new country. He had collected bits and pieces of, of memorabilia, of uh, campaign slogans, of newspaper articles, and he was also a gifted artist. We still use his original design, which on the left symbolizes New Jersey as liberty and on the right prosperity. Uh, the horses are still our state horse. And I always think of Colts Neck, New Jersey when I see the symbol. And we were primarily, originally, we were our productivity uh, our prosperity was forged by the plow, but our ingenuity brought us industry and New Jersey has been both a symbol of prosperity in both industry and agriculture. Now I show you this symbol on the left, the high above uh, high point, and I wanna point out something about our flag and the state symbol of a tree. Remember when I said we have other symbols of New Jersey, one of them is as recently as the 1950s, we adopted as our state tree, the red oak. The red oak is one of the fastest growing hardwood trees. And in the fall, it's pretty dramatic. And yet, without further thinking, without dialogue, without discussion, they adopted the red oak as being a great symbol. 
I disagree. I disagree because here in New Jersey, the white oak has been so symbolic. The white oak of Basking Ridge, the white oak of Salem, the Mercer Oak, which is still a Salem, a symbol of the battle. Uh, it, it fell, but it has been replaced by another Mercer Oak. The white oak was symbolic of the industry, of, of the mills, manufacture of mills, of wooden, of wooden superstructures, of the ships that were built in maritime New Jersey, both on uh, the eastern and western shores of our state. But I cannot discount the importance of the red oak. I believe that New Jersey should reconsider being the only state, and after all, at one time we were too, being the only state that has two state trees. I think that the red oak should symbolize liberty, the red hat of liberty, and the red sacrifice of the sacrifice of from Revolutionary War soldiers to those who have served even in our own century and in between. The soldiers that are represented by the symbol that you see on the left, representing those who served New Jersey, that symbol of remembrance. And on the right, the prosperity of New Jersey should be symbolized by the one tree that provided so much of the prosperity of New Jersey's past. And so that's the little ax to grind. And of course, our state legislatures may be too busy to consider now, but such a thing is underway. And the native population here in New Jersey has helped in bringing forth the importance of the oak and the significance of that Salem oak. Here you are witnessing one of 50 plantings that have happened independently around the state, representing peace and prosperity and continuation of the Salem Oak. If any of you have questions, I'm all yours. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much, Mr. Burroughs. I did enjoy that. Um, uh, if you, I, I'm sorry, Dahlia, you could just unmute yourself. Yes. I apologize. Go ahead. I just, I just wanted to say it was so interest, interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. It, I do pleasure. have one question. Yes. Why was he called William the Silent? Uh, maybe he didn't talk much in court, but he was a man <laughs> of action. He was okay. a man of action. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other thing was, um, so the New Jersey Museum, I saw something and I, for some reason, I missed where it is located. You oh, it's about located right on State Street in Trenton, New Jersey, a half a block from the State House. Yeah. And in between is the State Library, which is also an interesting place to peruse. Which is obviously someplace I'm going to have to go see. Yeah. <laughs> Um, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Yeah, yes, uh, please feel free. You can put them in the chat. Go, go ahead, Mr. Zagrini. Oh, no, thank you very much, uh, Eric. This was uh, fantastic. Uh, what a history. But, um, and my father was born 12 miles outside of Vineland, South Jersey. So I spent a lot of time in South Jersey, Swedesboro, all of that. And I, I grew, uh, I had a great appreciation for the history. But I, I had a question for you. Where is uh, the town of Wheaton and Wheaton Scientific Glass Stand in, in all of this. That's actually the industrial age of New Jersey, but because the other end of the state, not your end, but the other end tends to be very flat because at one time it was under the ocean and maybe sometime in the future, May it be many set generations from now, it may be well be underwater again. It was ocean bottom. So the, uh, the pine lands are kind of flat and there's all this silicon, all that sand really in some places. 
It's the most high quality sand for excellent glass making. And uh, back in the beginning of the industrial <laughs> age, uh, there were glass makers in Atlantic County that were making plate glass. There were ornamental glass makers uh, in Wheaton. Uh, there were um, in Salem, there were glass makers making utility glass like jars and milk bottles and beer bottles. Uh, glass had been a very big contributor uh, to the gross national product of, of New Jersey at one time. Uh, now, Wheaton uh, still exists. Uh, it is a, a largely a, uh, a working uh, museum. Uh, they do make ornamental glass there. Uh, you, can, you can witness glass blowing in the old style and the methodology used. It's a wonderful place to visit. Um, it is probably the only place in New Jersey that I can think of where you can really appreciate what had taken place on a much larger scale. One of the, um, the rug that came, that pulled out from under the glass blowing business of New Jersey was largely automation. When mechanical automation of bottle making uh, came to pass, Anger Hawking was a big name, a name you probably all recognize. That was one of the biggest employers in Salem County. They went bottom up, they no longer exist. Uh, they went through various stages, they went south, that didn't work. Um, glass can be made so much cheaper now uh, that uh, the artisan aspect of it is largely lost except in blowing art glass. But it's uh, an excellent place to visit uh, and you can witness uh, firsthand um, that part of our history. Yeah, yeah, the glass museum is, is really interesting. It was my understanding that a lot of um, the, the small bottles that held medicines, potions, everything, that all came from, from um, that part of New Jersey. Yeah, also and, in Vineland. Yeah, yes, well, uh, and I had one, you, you mentioned Haddonfield in the history, but you, for, you didn't mention the fact that Haddonfield was the, the first place in, to uh, uncover a complete dinosaur skeleton. Ah. <sighs> yeah, I, I wanted to go back to early times, but I only went back 12,000 years. But <laughs> yes, uh, you, can, you can witness the high hadrosaurus. That's right. <laughs> without bones, it's a full sculptural um, rendering that stands about two stories high, two and a half stories high. Uh, and it was made after... Uh, it's a wonderful story. It could be a program all by itself about the, <laughs> bones, the bones wars that started in New Jersey. The Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia was founded. The whole world of paleontology was an offspring from the almost complete dinosaur that was found in the peat bogs of South Jersey in Haddonfield. <laughs> and um, it started uh, a, an entire area of science, an entire area of collections, an entire rivalry between um, Ivy League universities. Uh, it, it's a, an incredible story. And maybe Wyoming and a few others are states that have state dinosaurs, but we're very proud to have one ourselves. Yeah, I, and I, there I, is a, uh, if you visit the Capitol building, uh, you will see a rendering of that dinosaur <laughs> without his, with his bones uh, at the uh, state house in stained glass. No, I, I hmm. absolutely agree with you. At the state museum, they do not have the original bones. The original bones, um, I've talked to, we have a state paleontologist. His name, I think, is Dr. Paris. Um, that's easy to remember. Um, 
he, uh, he told me that they have all the bones they were interested in, they have copies. In other words, they can pull a drawer open and go to the leg bone of the Hadrosaurus, but it's really a duplicate made from the original, which is at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So okay. we're, going, um, we're going very prehistory. Yeah. I know, <laughs> Elsie, you had yourself unmuted. Did you have a question? No, I was just listening. Okay. I Thank didn't know you. if you had a question. That's okay. all. Were there any others in the notes that you want to ask? Um, I didn't know if anyone had put a, I know, um, the only thing is that Donna had said Waterloo Village in Stanhope is still being maintained. I'm glad and then you I guess uh, you had, she didn't like the way you pronounced Alamucci. Uh, Alamucci. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's how obviously the natives pronounced it, but I guess she felt you needed to pronounce it Alamucci. Alamucci. So she did. So okay. she just stated we'll, that. Well, we'll put two O's in it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Anyway, those were the only, there wasn't, um, there was just, um, just the, that comment was the only thing. All right. So, good. Well, it's been a pleasure meeting you all. And all right. uh, I, uh, next time you're traveling around the state, we've given you some other things to explore and uh, chat about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. Burrow, thank you so much. Um, I know that there's some, there's some other programs that we have uh, for Eric that he may do for us. And I'll make sure everyone is made aware. And I just want to remind you all that tomorrow evening, there is a hybrid program, program on the Declaration of Independence. So if you haven't signed up for that, you can go ahead and sign up for that also. Um, oh, wait, we have one message. Hold on. Uh, Cheryl says, thank you. Thank you oh, very much, well, she says. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great place to start the Declaration of Independence because <laughs> that's where we left off. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Eric. I really thank appreciate you. it. I thought the program was great. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and we'll see you on the flip side. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, you, everyone. Everybody.